All right, here we go. Uh, good evening, good evening, everybody. My name is Brian McCullough. Uh, our regular meeting chair, Bill Wagstaff, is in Halifax right now. We couldn't get back in time for the for the meeting. Uh, so we've got a, an interesting lineup here uh, tonight. So uh, we'll go up to our, right away to our what's what tonight. Regular slot of Tim Cole with uh, Ottawa Skies just to let us know what's happening astronomically speaking uh, for the next month. Uh, Sylvie Letourneau with her 10-minute astronomy news. Chuck O'Dales with some uh, interesting crater identification uh, slides. Rob Dick with a mysterious presentation on how we see the stars. Okay, we'll have a break. We've got some door prizes here, a few door prizes for the break. Uh, Rob Alexander and Mike Mogadam will be talking about the uh, CARP star parties that have been uh, happening and uh, other things that will be coming up. Uh, and I and Tim Cole will be uh, doing a presentation on uh, a lunar presentation, Sunrise at Sinus Iridum, and our regular uh, section with, an, with observations and then announcements at the end. Are there any, uh, does anybody have any uh, comments on any observations they might have made uh, over the past while since the last meeting? Anything? Yeah, I got one. Yes. Yeah. Oh, what's up with that? Is that a cosmic alignment or something? <laughs> well, look, the two of us were working on sinus iridum. Yeah, maybe that's probably what it was. Anybody else uh, lay eyes on anything interesting there were, other than what we'll have in the observation segment? I, I, I looked up here every night for the last six or four nights, and I did not see the aurora. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. 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 right. Now, there had been talk that there was this huge coronal mass ejection that got belched off the sun and was heading earthward, but uh, the, all reports I know from southwestern Ontario, right across eastern Ontario, nothing. Because normally if you get a, a CME, coronal mass ejection, coming from the sun, it interacts with the uh, magnetosphere of the earth, and we get the, uh, the aurora, but uh, so far, nothing. Has anybody seen any aurora? Oh, okay, okay. As far as Wisconsin. In Wisconsin, yeah. All right. All right. So just before we get started, can you check your cell phones, Blackberries, and everything, please, and put them on, put your phasers on stun, please, so we don't have any ringing uh, telephones during the meeting? All right. And away we go with uh, Tim Cole. Oh one, oh, one first. Go ahead. Here we go. Uh, just to draw your attention, I uh, just received a, a copy of Sky News, the next edition of Sky News in the mail today, as uh, many people probably did. And in the... Uh, in the photography uh, segment, uh, one of our astrophotographers, uh, Sanjeev, uh, got an honorable mention for his uh, shot of the Sagittarius region looking toward the center of the, uh, the Milky Way galaxy. Yeah. All right, and I think we're ready to roll with, uh, with Tim. Yeah, well, didn't want to bump into Brian. Here we are for August. Yeah, uh, it's happening earlier and earlier. Um, we're dominated this month by uh, the uh, the uh, summer triangle, which I didn't draw on. Naughty, naughty boy. Uh, so here we have the infamous summer triangle. We've got Dennis and uh, Vega, and uh, somewhere down here, ah, oh, yes, there we go. We've got Altair with the training wheels on either side. At least that's how you recognize it. <laughs> and uh, I'll be taking a little look at Hercules. We still have a fair assortment of planets, and in fact, it's getting a little better. And yeah, I still have Pluto there. Um, sorry, uh, the IAU will probably get mad at us, but Pluto is still there. Um, Mercury, yep, you've got your chance near sunset. It's always a little tricky because it's fairly low, but uh, don't believe the nonsense about being monstrously difficult to find. It's not, it just tends to hide behind the houses and stuff. Um, trying to break in after dinner, I don't know. Uh, Venus, excellent chance for Venus. Of course, Venus is kind of underwhelming. Wow, look at Venus. It's a big white dot. Uh, anyway, the fun part with Venus is looking at it over several uh, several days and several weeks and watching the uh, watching the phase change. And as we'll see a little later, it's also handy for finding other stuff. Mars is still hanging in there, but um, that's even more underwhelming than Venus. Um, at least Venus is bright. 
Mars isn't, anyway. Uh, Jupiter, oh man, what can you say about Jupiter? That's just the obvious wonderful one. And Saturn, of course, if you uh, can catch it early enough, we still got it. Uranus is uh, popping out again, and since it's near uh, Jupiter, it's, it's fairly easy to track down. And we're gonna be uh, giving you a, an opportunity to think about Neptune. And Pluto, if you can find it in the brilliant muck of Sagittarius, well, good luck. Besides, who cares about Pluto anyway? It's not a planet. Dwarf planet or Plutoid or something. I don't know. Never mind. Plutoid, I don't know. It sounds like you need preparation H for it, but at any rate. Um, <laughs> never mind. Pa preparation P. Yes, never mind. Never mind. Never mind. Uh, we're not going there. Uh, August 13th, moon and three planets. Um, is there anything astronomically wonderful about this? No, but it's cool. Um, it's pretty, and uh, it's a crack at uh, faint wee Mars and still gorgeous Saturn, and of course, uh, the very young moon. Lots of fun. Um, at the end of the month, we have uh, Venus and Spica, and I always like that kind of alignment, uh, that, that kind of juxtaposition of two really bright things together like that. It, it's always just a cool thing, and the challenge for that will be seen if you can pick out Mars inside your uh, binocular uh, frame of that field of view, which we're showing you here, typical field of views for a set of 10 by 50, set of 10 by 50 binoculars. So that'll be a good challenge, see if you can pick Mars out of it, and uh, I probably won't be able to, but then again, I can't see where they do it anyway. Um, Jupiter and Uranus, um, the only real problem is it's a bit low in the sky until you're up fairly late, but of course we're astronomers and we don't sleep. Um, we're up there just underneath Pegasus. Um, Jupiter, of course, is so easy to find at night. It is fiercely bright right at the moment. And you've got uh, Uranus fairly close to it, so if you, if you just hunt around, you can probably find it without too much difficulty, um, even with a pair of binoculars if you've got a reasonable sky. Of course, if you're cheating and using go-tos, it's a more so to get to, but never mind. Um, now, tracking down Neptune, that's a little nastier. Uh, one of the things that can help you is finding um, Jupiter, and you can sort of guesstimate where the uh, ecliptic is and try to work your way down to uh, the nearly invisible Capricornus. Uh, so this is going to actually be a, a little bit of a, a, a bit of a fun exercise. You can see we don't have a lot of movement. There is some over the month. It's drifting its way into Capricornus, but uh, it's going to be hanging out there in uh, a fairly uh, nondescript chunk of sky. So uh, this should be kind of amusing to find. And then the fun part, we'll be arguing over what the color is because there's tremendous argument over what color uh, Neptune is. It always looks kind of gray to me, but I've heard people say, well, it's actually blue. Oh, really? Okay. Whatever you say. Walk away slowly. Anyway, never mind. Uh, Ceres is another fun one. Ceres is actually normally a reasonably uh, easy uh, asteroid, planetoid, minor solar system, uh, never mind. Dwarf plant, something like that. Anyway. Uh, except right at the moment, it's a little bit challenging because it's down in a really bright... Uh, Milky Way regions, so this should be also an interesting uh, exercise. You can see we've got a fair bit of motion over the month. Now, oh, back up, you, back up, back up, yes. Our solar system challenges. Uh, this is what we've come up with. Uh, we didn't come up with deep sky challenges because basically we didn't have any, but, uh, so we, we threw you a, a near sky challenge. Track down Neptune and Ceres. These are toughies because of where they are in the sky. Well, at least I think they're toughies, but you know, your mileage may vary. Okay, so give it a shot. See what you can try, see what you can track down for yourself. And this, this should be kind of amusing and fun and interesting, and there's tremendous history behind these, which I could babble on for ages about, which you all know. Um, so do check out some of the history, because it's quite fascinating, some of the history behind the discovery of Neptune and Ceres. Now, backyard deep sky, um, I call it M92, the other Hercules cluster. Uh, <laughs> if this were any place else but not near M13, M92 would be considered a pretty snazzy globular cluster. But because it's got this absolutely knockdown gorgeous M13, everybody forgets about poor old M92, and there aren't too many super bright stars near there. But it, it's fairly easy. Uh, once you've got M13, you can pretty much follow your way up from the uh, first plate, rest plate of bleh, first plate of Hercules and track down M92, and it's, it's a fun one. Um, in a way, that picture's a little, um, I wish I picked a different one, because that kind of suggests it's as big as bright M as M13. It isn't, it's a little uh, It's a little small, but it's quite a nice uh, It's quite a nice little globular, and if it weren't next to such a big, gorgeous one, we'd probably be considering it as a, a lot cooler than it is. 
I left the M57 in the ring up there just to, well, because it's up there and you'll probably want to take a peek at it if you're going to wander by M13. We've got the Perseids coming up this month, and uh, for a miracle, there is a virtually new moon at the time, so you have actually a decent opportunity to see it. Um, this is, uh, 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 I can't think of the word, I can't get the word out. Anyway, it, it's a, uh, oh, speak. What, time exposure of the radio? Time exposure, but uh, yeah, it's also um, composite. Composite, thank you. Yes, composite video. No, com no. but God. Uh, composite photograph. Anyway, uh, and with this, you can actually see where the radiant is, and that, that's really cool. I think it's really cool, anyway. So, uh, Perseids, uh, it's actually pretty straightforward. 12th to the 13th. New Moon's actually on the 10th, but, um, and, and you can probably pick up some Perseid meteors around then. It's a fairly flat peak. It's, it's not this sort of kind of, whoa, boom, evening of the peak is nothing. Um, it, it goes on for quite a bit before and after. Uh, in fact, the actual peak for the Perseids is at about 8 p.m., so we're going to miss the real peak of it. But even so, around midnight will probably be a, your best crack at finding things. Um, why the heck do we call it a Perseid? Because it appears that all the meteors associated with that shower are coming from a point right near the constellation of Perseus. And all that's happening is the debris left behind by a comet called Swift Tuttle is forming a nice little debris trail, and when the Earth plows through it every year, we happen to be facing in the direction of Perseus. So it gives us the parallax, the, the um, oh man, I can't speak tonight. That gives us the, uh, yeah, thank you, the convergence effect. Basically the effect of driving into a snowstorm. Yeah, I'll tap dance later. Um, and this is why we have this illusion of everything coming from Perseus. It's not, it's, it's a trick of perspective. That was the word I wanted. And, um, you know, it's still kind of fun to be able to track these things down. Now, here's the trick with it. This is what's making your typical meteor. This is not making any one of Chuck's big holes in the ground. This is pretty much what you've got for meteor dust. Uh, now, a few suggestions for the meteor watching in general. Uh, try to look above the horizon so you can get away from the globe. Uh, now, don't look towards the radiant. I notice a lot of people have tried that. You know, oh, it's, it's a Perseus. You've got to look towards Perseus. Now, that's, that's where everything's coming from. So if you're going to look at that and just stare at the radiant, you're going to miss a lot of stuff. So try to look away from it. One fellow I ran into suggested 40 degrees. You can argue with me about that because, heck, I don't know. But uh, basically, don't look at the radiant. Tonight, this time around, where we don't have a very bright moon, it'll be setting early, the deepest, darkest area you can find will do you the best. So to try to, it, it's worth a trip. Even if it isn't an opportunity for you to go out, do try to find the darkest you can, even if it's a dark chunk of your backyard. Anything to cut down that light. If it's clear, it'll be cold. Get yourself a lawn chair, set yourself in. I say a sleeping bag, and I mean it, because when you're sitting there idle, it gets flippin' cold. Hot drinks, light snacks. Uh, binoculars to observe trails. I'll have some people who will hit me over the head with those binoculars, because we'll keep insisting, don't use binoculars, it's a full sky anomaly. But it's kind of cool if you've got uh, trails. However, don't bother with a telescope. You can try photography, and the classic method is put it next to your armchair and aim it up to the sky and just leave the thing on bulb. If you're using a DSLR, which is particularly uh, mungy on batteries, you might want to take a uh, portable power supply with you and uh, power the camera without running your batteries flat, because I've had that happen to me a few times. Um, five minute exposure tends to work for me. I usually get a couple, and I stink at astrophotography, so if I can get a couple of meteors you definitely can. And here is the meteor. Oh, no, we don't have. Oh yes, here we go. Wasn't this cool? Was this today, Glenn? Uh, yeah, two, days ago. two days ago. Yeah. Can you imagine this in the Globe and Mail on meteor shower calendar? Full page. Wow. It was a full, yeah, it was a full page. A full ad page ad in the on, on the back page of a section, but you can scroll. Can you scroll down through that, uh, Chris? Uh, yeah. Can you, uh, Chris? Yeah, I, don't, I don't know how to do that here. Yes, make a wish. Now, I'm wondering if a meteor shower gives you more opportunities to get this. Uh, at 150 meteors per hour, that would be you have 150 chances every hour to win, to get your spider. That's the door prize for the most meteors on one exposure. There you go. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot, Tim. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. All right, and uh, just mention, just while I'm here right now, I failed to mention uh, Chris Terran at the controls here. So uh, Chris does a lot of work putting the uh, the program together for us, uh, you know, taking people's uh, presentations, some of the last minute things. So it's a lot of, a lot of fun actually working with them to, uh, to to do the final the final steps.
Are you ready to roll? Uh, oh, this? Let's see. You ready? I okay. Good evening, everyone. So, in the news today, the first is not the news. How does that Do you want us to advance the slides for you? Yeah. No, thank okay. you. Um, this is a small announcement. We, um, some people on the email list have received a, um, an email about this uh, course that's happening in London at the beginning of uh, September on uh, planetary science. Uh, if uh, you haven't had the email or you haven't had a chance to look at it and you want to see, I have a few, of, uh, a few copies of the description of the course and some more information about it, including prices and whatnot. Um, and um, also, if some people are going, it would be nice to tell uh, perhaps uh, Brian or myself. Um, so in the news, um, rabbit holes on the moon. Um, back in the 60s, um, before I was born, <laughs> or before the, it, the website said before humans, humans went on the moon, um, actually, I was born when men went on the moon, but I wasn't born when they started seeing those uh, tunnels on the surface of the moon. They came from pictures that um, they got from the early orbiters. Uh, I have an old book here from 1970-ish, and um, it actually has those old pictures. And you can see the channels, but you cannot see anything that would look like, um, like this here, this hole. Um, so from there, the uh, scientists sort of knew that there was evidence of tunnels which the lava had uh, flown billion of mil billions of years ago. Um, now, like on Earth, um, Hawaii, for example, those lava tubes are formed when the upper layer of the lava flowing from the volcano starts to cool down, and the lava underneath continues to flow in those tubular channels. Um, the ardent lava above insulates the lava below, and it can continue flowing for a while. Now, the tubes that are created, we knew they existed. Now, what happened is the uh, NASA Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter started taking pictures of what looks like a cavern or a hole to one of those tubes. Um, so these would be like entrance to uh, Wonderland, um, um, to those um, to those tubes. Uh, so last year, the Japanese spacecraft Kaguya, if I pronounce that correctly, took the first pictures of one of those holes. And then now, the la over the last month, the uh, LRO started taking more pictures of it, and has a little more details um, about the hole that was found. Now this one is on uh, Marius Hills. And what they think now is that is about 65 meters in diameter and may extend up to 80 meters down on the ground. Um, if I can, yeah, next. Uh, this is a picture of the area, and um, that picture is from uh, Kaguya, and um, that's when they first saw it without all that, those details but it showed the area of where it is. Uh, and from the previous picture from the 70s, you can clearly see that you don't have enough details to see those holes, but now you do. This is more what it looked like in the 70s, and this is more what we have today. And, um, and then you can clearly see that, well, it's leading somewhere. Now, um, so with both those pictures from Kaguya and the uh, LRO, I'm getting like Tim, uh, now we believe that the idea of the lab tube is now confirmed. So these tunnels are at least intact in small segment, even after several, several million years. But <clears throat> also, uh, we don't know if some of them are still filled with, with the solidified lava. So we don't know how far we can get with this if we were to go down one of those holes. So it's, and it's hard to tell with the remote instruments. So we would need to send like a probe or something down there. Um, but we could find a lot more of those caves that you cannot see unless you have the resolution of the LRO. 
So that, that raised the questions of, uh, well, should we uh, follow the white rabbit? Alice found a whole new world when she went down the hole uh, following the white rabbit. So what are we going to find in those lunar holes? Well, even if we don't find anything specific, um, in those lava tubes, uh, we would be shielded from radiation. So there would be, um, well, and also more stable from all the thermal variation on the moon. So for example, if you are about two meters down the surface of the moon, the temperature would vary from about minus 30 Celsius to minus 40 Celsius. Uh, that may not be really warm, but at least it's better than on the surface if you're close to the equator. And over one lunar day, the temperature varies from minus 150 Celsius to plus 100 Celsius. So that could be interesting for future lunar stations or um, I'll suggest that to use them for uh, long-term storage. Store whatever you want in there for a few billion years. It seems to hold up pretty good. Or the gift shop. Hey, or the gift shop. Well, they were on the website they were talking about the Lunar Hilton, you know, yeah. for a vacation. Yeah. Tim Hortons, uh, yeah, okay. so. Why don't you eliminate the hole with your laser beam and so we can see down inside? <laughs> <laughs> yes. I cannot be that stable. Oh, okay. <laughs> Funny. So, um, and now I'm going to get, uh, that's going to get interesting. Um, the most uh, uh, massive star. So how massive can a star be? Well, the known limits are right now, or were, I should say, uh, the smaller stars are limited to about 80 times the size of Jupiter's. Jupiter's mass, and below which they fail, they're failed stars or brown dwarfs. But on the other side of the scale, the most massive stars so far were um, about 150 solar masses for their uh, birth masses. Um, so with what I'm going to talk about tonight, this limit is raised by about a factor 2 to 300 solar masses. Um, so what they looked at is um, in a region they found a star which they named R136 A1, that's a mouthful, um, and it would be the most massive star ever found with a current mass of about 265 suns. That's its current mass. At its birth it would have been about 320 times the mass of the sun. <laughs> So, and just to give you an idea, the luminosity of it is about 10 million times greater than the sun. Um, so they would think that this record is hard to break because it doubles the previous one. And uh, um, that massive star, well, one that, what I want to explain is they, because they're so big, they are powerful, they outflow and they lose a lot of weight as they age. Um, compared to humans who are trying to put on weight when they age. Um, um, my case anyway. Uh, being a little over a million year old, that which I would just call A1 instead of R136A1. A1 is a middle-aged star and it's lost already a fifth of its initial mass. That's why it's down to 265 uh, times the sun. But uh, through the models, they think it was 320 times the mass of the sun. So that was done by a team of astronomers in the UK. Um, they were using uh, two things. They're using the uh, European Southern Observatory, the ESO, the Very Large Telescope, the, the VLT, and lots of letters here, and the NASA Hubble <laughs> Telescope as well. And they've been looking at two uh, young clusters of star, that RMC136A, um, which has a lot of young, massive, hot stars and that is about 165,000 uh, light years away. And also they did look at uh, NCG 3603, and they have found a few stars that are pretty big in there as well, um, but uh, the 136A1 is by far the biggest. Um, <clears throat> So uh, this team is finding several stars with the surface temperature that's more than seven times hotter than the sun. 
that are 10, 10 times larger, several million times brighter. And um, using those models, most of the stars that they have found, or the, well, the big ones that they have found, were born with masses of over 150 times, 50 times the sun. So over that limit that we previously knew. Um, um, there, and that's where I tried to, and this is the only picture I have of the uh, region, and it never said anywhere which are, which, where is that A1 star in there, but I can see that some of the biggest ones are probably those ones that they're talking about in the article that are over 150 times the mass of the sun, or they were actually when they were born. Paul, Paul, would you want? <laughs> Paul seems to know. I saw that on, uh, on the, uh, it was on the yeah. ESO, you know, the European Southern. It's the one on the right, that right one right there. Yeah, that's the one. That's <coughs> it's, in, it's in there? It's in there. In, inside the bus. Yeah, yeah. That's where, oh. that's where it is. That's where it is. So yeah, I can see. Yeah, okay, in there. One right in the center, the top. There's uh, about 20 stars there, so and that makes the brilliant one. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the problems, is it's so, like it says that A1 alone energizes its surrounding by a factor of 50 compared to the uh, Orion Nebula cluster. So it's, it's so bright, it's, uh, it's, just, um, it's just hard to, uh, to observe. Um, so the heavyweight stars are rare, puzzling, forming within those densest star cluster, and uh, they're short-lived and they have powerful winds. So they do need that re resolving power of the uh, very large telescope to be able to see the individual massive stars. Now, um, the other thing is the, the stars that are right, that we know now that are between eight and 150 times the solar mass, they explode at the end of their um, lives uh, and uh, they turn into supernova and leaving, you know, an uh, exotic neutron star or black hole behind. Now, the stars that are between 150 and 300 solar masses, um, they're speculating now that they could lead to exceptionally bright supernova, and we don't know because we haven't observed one yet, and they could be completely blown. Um, they could completely blow themselves apart, leaving nothing behind and dispersing clouds of up to uh, 10 times the solar mass in iron around them. But that we won't know. They, do, they did mention that there's a few candidates of uh, massive stars to, uh, to check in the coming years to see when, what's going to happen at the end of their lives. How far away is this? Um, 136. A1 is 165,000 light years away. Okay. Is it a large Magellanic cloud, one of these satellite yeah. galaxies of the Milky Way? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and the other region, the NCG 3603, is only 22,000 light years away. But this one's a little farther. Farther the better. <laughs> Okay, well, um, now, <laughs> Brian, you, you sort of, <laughs> you sort of stole my, you, you give away my little surprise here. Um, so I'm back with, uh, with the sun. As Brian has said, the uh, sun has uh, been uh, doing some uh, cute stuff lately. So the, sun activity, the sun's activity level is going through cycles of about 100 years on average. Um, the last solar maximum occurred in 2001, so we were right now in sort of a low, but with this eruption that happened on August 1st, um, we're, and what I'm about to show you, um, is one of the first signs that the sun is waking up from its vacation. Um, so the sun's surface erupted and uh, blasted tons of plasma into space, and we have video, should we, is that? Yeah. Oh, showtime. Do I have to do something? Or? It's on. Oh. So, on this first one, you have to look at this area carefully. It, you won't see it as, as well as the other ones. Do we do it another time? I'll do it again. Just a couple seconds. I'm probably over time already. Where's the fork? Yeah, we'll just have to. <laughs> 
Now this is supposed to be totally um, disconnected from what happened. Now can we show the next one, which is a little uh, more explicit in the dark. I think you'll see. Is that something else? No, it's the same thing. Yeah. yeah. So as Brian said, the plasma was heading our way and should have created the spectacular northern lights on August 4th, but we've missed it. It seems only Norway got to, uh, to see it. And um, the last one, which is my favorite, for a second, but. That's one of Tim's retinal scans. <laughs> <laughs> Side like that, how could it be coming towards Earth? That side happened to be towards Earth. Yeah, well, the, that, those videos are not taken from Earth. Sorry, I wasn't very specific. Um, those are taken from the uh, Solar Dynamic Observatory, which I presented a bit on it uh, in May, back in May. Um, so that's, uh, that's in the same line. And I think that's it. Oh, yeah, no, there's something else. That, is not part of my presentation, but Chris found that there are some apps of this for the iPhone, and that's why he put that in there, so I would say this. Anything to add to that, Chris? Nothing, it's self-explanatory there. are brand new apps introduced by NASA, uh, specifically highlighting the sun from the stereo mission and showing you daily what's happening on the sun. Good stuff. Right. The sun on the go. Thank you. Okay. There you go. Okay, I don't know if turn this okay up. Mr. Simbi. Here, I'll give you a little. Uh... <laughs> so I what is this book? What is it? That's the 1970 pictures of have... the lunar surface. I'm going to have to see your book for sure. Yeah, you come and see it okay. after. Okay, Mr. Simbi. Uh, All right. Jerk. Rock and roll. Do you want the uh, hand oh, mic yeah. or? Oh, I'll do this guy here. Oh, oh, this <laughs> Yeah, this was a, um, uh, one found on Google Earth, believe it or not. Uh, somebody uh, uh, suggested it, and a few geologists went and looked at it, and lo and behold, yes, it is a crater, which is a great segue into my talk tonight. I'm going to uh, kind of give you some hints on uh, what to look for if you're looking for a meteorite crater. When you're tromping through the bush and you see something strange, hey, you just might find a crater. And if it is, you'll be famous. But as your uh, coordinator of meteorite craters, um, I'm going to uh, give you some news on what happened in the solar system in the last little while. Um, this one on the moon is a brand new crater uh, compared to the, let's see if I get this right. Whoa, what happened? Yeah, there we go. Oh, there it is, okay, I pushed the wrong button. Apollo 15 uh, picture and just recent, 2009. So the moon is still being peppered. Mars got zapped just a little while ago. And this is a real weird one. I want to show it to you. Uh, not that it's a new one or not, but uh, here's a crater within a crater. Now, what's the chances of a impact inside a crater? You know, this is on Mars. And the uh, geologists are still mulling over this because this one looks fresher. But there's no ejecta, it seems, from it. So it could be a collapse within the uh, center part of the crater or not. So uh, next time I fly out there, I'll take a look at it. Yeah. <laughs> Ask Rolf to do a better image. Yeah, <laughs> yeah Rolf, uh, let's get in there. But this is a real weird one. But the chances of a crater within a crater is, well... And just to show that we're still in the shooting gallery, uh, Jupiter just a little while ago got hit as well. So uh, it's happening. Peter Cervalo, are you here tonight? In the uh, GA in uh, New Brunswick, we had an excellent presentation on meteorite craters by a guy from uh, University of uh, New Brunswick. I can't remember his name. Was it Paul Gray who did that? Was it Paul Gray? Uh, no, no, it wasn't. Um, any, anyway, uh, he, his pr final part of the presentation was what can we do to prevent these things from hitting us and so on. And essentially it's worldwide cooperation. And Peter came up with the uh, quote of the uh, whole meeting saying, well, looks like we're toast. <laughs> <laughs> because it's not a case of if it's going to happen, it's I guess it's when. So uh, the dinosaurs didn't have a space program. We better get uh, bucking on here. Anyway, um, 
Uh, I can't remember why I put that in there, but I, I love it anyway. Uh, these two uh, craters, the, they're uh, right by the Apollo uh, uh, 11 landing uh, site, but uh, looking at those through the telescope, you'll get a good uh, uh, appreciation of what crater sizes look on our planet because they're the exact same size and orientation of the um, Clearwater uh, craters in northern Quebec. These guys right there. And this is just a little history, uh, 1950s. This is a very uh, new science, uh, crater uh, uh, studies. And this is pretty well what we knew about craters in the 1950s. And 20 years later, we've got that. This is just in Canada. And now uh, there's over uh, 250 craters known on this planet. And uh, I'll, what I like to say is within a day's driving distance of where you're sitting right now, there are 10 major meteorite craters you could visit. Just uh, give you something to think about. So, um, how do we identify a crater? Well, first thing, uh, Eric and I went up and took a look at this guy. And uh, circular. Well, the, the one they found on uh, Google Earth, the one in Egypt that I told you about, it was a circular object they found, and they investigated it, and yes, it is a crater. And uh, this is the, uh, the uh, Chubb crater up, or the uh, New Quebec uh, Pingulet crater up in northern Quebec. Um, brand new, 60 million years old, and Eric and I uh, camped there, walked up here, and uh, explored right around this guy. That was quite the trip. Hey, Eric. Where did you land? Um, actually, uh, there's a park here now, and there's a small strip right there. I didn't land myself. I came in with a, with a twin otter. Uh, a couple of girls, uh, they were late 20s, I'll tell you, and these girls knew how to pilot that airplane. They sure did. And they, 500 foot long uh, runway, and they got her in and out. No problem at all. An aircraft carrier. Yeah, exactly. It was cool. But anyway, the, uh, the uh, airport's right over there. And it's a good, uh, you know, two, three kilometer walk up here. And it's not an easy walk either. So, uh, circular. Well, here's two circular objects. Which one is an impact? One is, one isn't. Hmm. Let's figure this out. Well, what do we look for? Well, first of all, we look for circular objects, right? And we'll go to Manicouagan. And yes, it's circular. Wow. And I love that picture. Yeah. I got a good thermal on that one to get on that picture. <laughs> um, I just want to mention, uh, if you ever look at the uh, 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 Manicouagan crater, we, uh, Eric and I explored in this little area here. A lot of good sites to see we'll show you in a second. But if you notice here, look at this circular object. And I mentioned that to the professor at the University of New Brunswick, and he said, maybe. Nobody's really explored it, so uh, it's a case of, well, it might be and it might not be. So Eric and I are going to go there someday, and we'll be famous if we find. But what are we going to look for? Well. On the way to Manicouagan, there's shattered rock. Yeah, it could be. This uh, is about 60 kilometers away from this point zero at Manicouagan. And, uh, you, you know, we've all driven through the uh, Canadian Shield and saw the rock cuts of the solid rock. Well, this is what it looks like when it got zapped by a meteorite, a large one. Impact breccia. This is impact melt around here. This here is the country rock that got blasted out of the hole and then plop, plop, plop back into the lava. Yeah, that could be a sign of a meteorite crater, but uh, naturalistic around volcanoes could be the same thing. More breccia, yeah, getting closer. And I just wanted to bring this up. This is a good tourist uh, a shot. Uh, here's Chuck Peddle and his brains out, and Eric taking pictures all the time. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, we're heading for this cliff in the background is an impact melt picture. And uh, this was just a good tourist uh, picture. And I read a paper later that showed a real cool anomaly on that cliff. And this is a picture from Eric right there. That is a large piece of country rock. Now, just let me get my, my uh, statistics. The, um, what you're looking at here is impact melt. This used to be about two kilometers thick at one time. Now this is 240 million years ago, so there's been a few years of, um, of uh, erosion. But here we go. This rock basically got ballistically blasted out of the crater. You got all the impact melt from the uh, impact, and this big rock goes plop into the lava, and it starts to sink. 
Uh, pum, 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 pum. Where are we here? Okay. The rock is three grams per cubic centimeter more dense than the melt. So you have a constant rate of sinking. So the paper was dedicated to the uh, study of, whoops, of um, the rate of sink of this rock, which would give a rate of the quenching of the impact melt. It was a fascinating paper, lots of mathematical equations on it. Uh, I'm sure everybody would love it. But anyway, this was a, a real unique uh, uh, shot, and Eric and I were just taking random pictures, and it was just awesome we got this one. And this is a pure cliff of impact melt. Uh, yes, this could be, uh, if you see a cliff like this and it's impact melt, if you identify it, you might have a meteorite crater. But the main point of this whole talk is how you and I, looking at rocks, can identify it. Well, I took this picture and I looked around and I looked down and what did I see? A shatter cone. Now this is something that you can see with your eyeball that is very unique to a very high pressure explosion, a nuclear explosion or a, a, an impact. Uh, 240 million years ago, nuclear explosion, 240 million years ago, a large impact. Well, I'll go with the impact. So, shatter cone. I've got one here I'm going to put out. It's not a door prize. You can look at it during the break. <laughs> Take a look at it during the break and uh, study it. And if you see something like that while you're walking through the bush, you find yourself an impact crater. Uh, this is just another tourist uh, site from Eric and I. Uh, we were marooned on this island for uh, 22 hours. Nice, calm weather we found. And here's a canoe back here. You can see the size of the canoe relative to the waves. And that canoe was full of rocks. Yeah. <laughs> We barely made it on that island, we lit a fire, dried ourselves off, and uh, 22 hours later, in the middle of the night, it calmed down and we just hightailed it out. But we had enough food for another five days. It was great. Yeah, we would have made it. What a trip that was. Anyway, so getting back to how, which one is the circular one and which one isn't, let's go to Slade Island and uh, I'll show you another shatter cone. This here is the largest identified shatter cone on the planet, and that's me for scale. So it gives you a, an idea how big these guys are. So, which one is the impact structure? This one here is Lake Scutamata, just by the Bon Echo uh, uh, Lake. Uh, we, Eric and I just flew over that today. Uh, I want, before I go on, Bon Echo was very unique. It used to be all ocean around here, and as the ocean receded, uh, some uh, biology was left behind. Well, uh, Bon Echo has a freshwater shrimp in it. It's the only one in the world, apparently, from uh, the ocean. So it evolved into uh, being a freshwater shrimp. And up here, this is uh, Presqu'île in northern Quebec. That's right, yes. Uh, we took a picture of Nirvana for the observers uh, later. Uh, they can, uh, we saw it from the air. Instead of looking from there looking up, we were up there looking down. So this is where Presqu'île is, up in northern Quebec. That is an impact site. The other one was not. Scutamata was a geological feature. Very circular, though. <clears throat> These are shatter cones at Presqu'île. Uh, scale my finger, and there's a shatter cone there. This one here, an interesting story. Eric and I were paddling along uh, uh, Presqu'île, enjoying life. All of a sudden, this big rain shower, black, black, black cloud was coming towards us. So we paddled like heck. Well, I did. Eric was taking pictures. <laughs> we, uh, we, get, we got into the lee of an island and waited there. And yeah, it was quite a storm. And uh, we were sitting there dis discussing life, the universe, and everything. And uh, it rained and rained and rained. So I said, what the heck? I'm going to get out and look around. The first rock I picked up was a shatter cone. Awesome. I was joking. Yeah, I Eric was, saying, was joking. Look, there's a shatter cone, and you look. I'm yeah. Sure there was one. And I picked it up. There it was. So, that's how you can identify a shatter cone. I'm going to leave one out here. Take a look at it at the break. If you see one in the bush, you're going to be famous. <laughs> Sorry, uh, Brian, I was as fast as I could. Oh, no, that's good. That's good. <laughs> Thank you, Jack. Yeah, that's good. Thanks a lot, Chuck. Okay, shatter cone right here after the break. And okay, the, no, the non-door door prize. prize. The non-door prize, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Rob Dick, you're up next. 
how do we see the stars? We've seen a lot of pictures similar to this. Though this is taken from Desktop Universe, so that's kind of cheating. But we've seen similar pictures like this which show bright stars and, uh, now which one is it? The right one. The right one. Right. Bright stars, dark background, good contrast, and that sort of thing. And these, what we see nowadays usually are all digital pictures. Not too many people dare bring in, bring in their old film pictures. But most of them are digital and they've enhanced them so they look really nice. But the telescopic views are very different from this. And I, I see the pictures that are shown at the observers group meeting and sometimes, sure, they're long 10-hour exposures. But even there's something about those pictures that differ from this, the guttural feel you get when you look at the sky through a telescope. I have an F4 telescope, so you end up seeing very, it's designed to, to show the nebula very well and also the background texture of the sky itself. So this is, the, this is what we get when we come to a meeting, we see something like this and it looks somewhat artificial when I compare my view through a telescope. Do pe when people look through telescopes, I just want to get sort of a show of hands here, do people see images like this or am I going blind? Option B. Oh dear, okay. Well, how many people observe from very dark sites? A few, okay. And how many people have, say, F4 focal ratio telescopes? Good, there's not too many people that are gonna argue with me. Okay, good. <laughs> so, when you get a picture like this, usually you, uh, you can look at the stars, they're good optics, it's a Cerevol optics, so it must be good. There's good contrast between the stars and the background, so you see the very, very faint stars. You want to enhance the contrast so that you can see these faint stars silhouetted or, or it's standing above the background somewhat. Also, you haven't taken such a long exposure, though admittedly DSLRs don't have this problem anymore, where you can get bleeding of the starlight from one pixel to its adjacent pixel, so you see lines. So some people take many short exposures and they add them together to avoid this smearing of, vertical smearing of lines. So you don't have any pixel to pixel contamination. Now this is very different from what your, how your eye works. Not sure which way to do this. This is what I see. Now granted, I, I've, stood, I've sat at the telescope for maybe 45 minutes looking at a faint field, but this is more of the sense of the image or the field of view that I get when I look at it with my unaided eye, with, when I look at it with my eye through a telescope. Very, very different. And you can see some of this. Now which one is the light? The front of, I use the middle one. The middle, good. And you can see these dark rivulets all throughout here, adding sort of like a, a different uh, different texture to it and you can see it's not that you see stars behind these stars but you see a bit of a glow you see a bit of a nebulosity behind these and the nebulosity isn't there but it's it's something in the visual field of your eye that you're picking up and I think this is what when I look through a telescope at a for a long time you're very dark adapted this is what you end up seeing at least what I see now First of all, you've got a very dark field, so your eye is able to become very, very dark adapted. And good dark adaption means you're using your rod vision. Your rod vision, the very, very sensitive light detectors in your eye, and that would seem to be good. If you look, but they tend to be around the, the periphery of your, your field of view. Your eye, your eye lens is is, has evolved to give you good imagery in the center. Your eye lens is actually a terrible piece of optics, but your brain's able to work on it and give you the best it can. But here, your rod vision that you're using when you're dark adapted, you're using the periphery of your vision where the correction in your eye is the worst. So, we also have an interesting effect with the rod cells and that the cells in the center that give you a lot of the details so you can read that fine print, read newspapers and so on. They're individual cells connected to neurons that go, that send the signal back to your brain. But the rods are so sensitive that if that was the case, then what would happen would be your eye would be, or your brain be flooded with signals because of the misfiring of the rods. Because they're so sensitive, a little kick of thermal noise wouldn't end up sending a signal back to your brain. So it actually bundled together on the order of 10 or so for each neuron back. And there's a bit of diplomacy going on between each rod cell to say whether or not they've actually detected something or not. 
So that right away blurs the image somewhat because instead of getting a single cell signal sent back, you're now getting a bundle. So the stars themselves are bloated. Now, the fainter stars, the ones at the threshold of your vision, they're, the, the, they're also triggering rod cells. So the rod cell sends a start firing, even though you don't really see the light, the very, very faint starlight, it'll still trigger your rods to fire. And so this gives a bit of this glow. Some of the, the cells, for, for example, some of the stars, if we look at here, for example, oh, say up around here, it looks like a little tiny, well, not a, it's a non-cluster, but there's a bit of a glow behind it. And that's because of these, this starlight is affecting the rod cells to the side, and even the bundles of rod cells, as your brain tries to do an image processing trick to improve the image somewhat. And I also mentioned the very poor quality of your eye lens, causing this ab the aberrations in that will take the brighter starlight and blur it. And so what we end up seeing here is when you see the starlight here between the riblets of stars, you actually see a dark area. And that's because this starlight here is smeared somewhat, giving you a sense of nebulosity around that grouping of stars. Interesting effect. At least this is what I see. But since you people don't have an F4 telescope and you go to a dark site, you, you, you don't have any comment to say in this. So here's a comparison of the two. When I'm observing from the city, well, uh, granted, I, I, see, I see a very bright background because of the light pollution, and I don't see any of this little nebulosity effect when I'm in the city. But this is what you'd see, say, with a telescope, sorry, with a, a digital camera. This is what you see with your eye on a very dark site when you're well dark adapted. So when you go to look through a telescope, try to compare what you're actually seeing, especially if you're able to get out to a dark site at, uh, say, a public star night or, or out to FLO or if you go to Starfest or you go somewhere else where there's a dark site. Try to let your eye get dark adapted, put the camera away, and just stare into the eyepiece, especially if it's a fast telescope that will show you a lot of these very, very faint features, and see if your eye shows that or not. If not, come back and tell me, because it uh, doesn't sound like everybody's, anybody's got an opinion. Well, there's a few people with an opinion, like, like Glenn and so on. Yes, Glenn? <laughs> Well, the F-ratio of the telescope has nothing to do with this because mm -hmm. it's the exit pupil at the eyepiece yes. which determines the image brightness. So mm -hmm. if you had a long F-ratio telescope, you'd just use a much longer focal length eyepiece to give you a suitably large exit mm -hmm. pupil. Yeah, it turns out I got just a standard variety. Well, you know the setup I've got. So, But it's interesting, the uh, uh, Glenn, is, Glenn, I suppose, uh, a few others here might actually have the talent to be able to critique me on this. Yes, Paul. I think it was Hubble himself, the more, one of the most famous uh, observers and astronomers. He said there are things that you can see that you can't photograph, and there are things that you can photograph that you can't see. Mm -hmm. And I think he's right even to this day. Yes, we, we certainly see stuff in the pictures that are shown here at the meetings, but it's very difficult to catch uh, and, uh, something that prompted this presentation is that looking through the telescope and say this doesn't look anything like the pictures I see at the meetings. So I thought I'd bring this to your attention in case perhaps you can uh, see uh, see the same sort of thing or not see the same sort of thing. Rob, Rob, yes. just out of curiosity, do you use any type of uh, nebular filtering or filtering or broadband filtering when you do your visual observing? In the city. Okay. The uh, Do I use filters? Uh, in the city I did. Uh, the, old, the high contrast filter, which is typically used for getting rid of light pollution. Nebula filters, if I'm looking for some very small planetaries, and it's like day and night, you literally put in a, if you put in a, a filter, if this is a planetary, and you put in, say, an oxygen-3 filter, which means an oxygen atom that's lost two electrons, and that particular wavelength is allowed to pass through the filter, well, then all these go away, and you're left with that. It's kind of magic. and. Uh, so these filters really do work, uh, but you do need some extra light. And you also have to have a way of holding that filter so you can flip them back and forth. I think that uh, the, stro the, the flipping back and forth with the filter, without the filter, is really great. I, I don't like screwing them into eyepieces. I'd rather have a slide with filters on them. You've got a couple more. So How did you make the image? How did I make the image? Oh, gosh. I cheated. 
But then again, I'm using my eyes. So I, in a lot of the photography I do for light pollution and things like that, I try to make the image what I see. And the one on the right is from Desktop Universe. The one on the left is the Desktop Universe that I've done a number of things to. Um, typically a Gaussian, a very, very large Gaussian blur, adjust the gamma and a brush the, uh, adjusted the brightness to give that brighter appearance to it that I see in the eyepiece. So it's simulated. It's simulated. Because otherwise uh, you can't see what's in my eye, so you'll have to trust me and that's my, my interpretation on a computer screen. And even then, when I look at it now, there's a different projector than what I use at home. I, so I would tend to darken it down a little bit more. But uh, yeah, it does look too bright. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Got, and you've got this as well. Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> Forty-five years ago, the Ottawa Centre was very, very different from the way it is now. The, in fact, there seemed to be about 30, 25 to 30 percent of the membership in what we called the Observers Group uh, were actually high school students and young university students. And these people were the people that did all the grunt work and also did all the clever stuff and imaginative work. And one of them was John Conville, who was a high school student when he joined our group. And, and uh, he just ended up dying about uh, three weeks ago, which is, came as a bit of a shock because he's younger than most of us that have the gray hair now. There's a few of you in this audience that might remember John. And so the idea is just to let you know of, of his passing. This picture was taken circa 1970 or so where we had our, our main observing site was called Quiet Site and that's located out the west end of Ottawa. Some of you remember, oh, what's the museum? Uh, down the Little Road, the Y Camp. Down which road? Uh, the y Camp. The, oh, the y, down by the YMC. It was yeah, point, the, near uh, the solar observatory? Point. Point. Penny's Point, yeah. And uh, if you go down to Penny's Point, you end up going down this road called Riddle Road, and you make a left down to Penny's Point. Well, if you try to make a right, you hit a locked gate. And this the quiet site was in behind that locked gate. And it's a property from the, um, from the Communication Research Council out there that we're using. And here's a picture of what it looked like. Uh, we're not supposed to touch these antennas. It was covered with antennas. And so I climbed up one of the antennas and uh, took a picture of the site. Beautiful site. This contraption here is where we did meteor observing. In fact, most of the observing work we did were meteor observing, where you sit around and get to know people, talk and learn. And John was one of the most uh, intelligent people in the entire group, I can tell you. Uh, he was well above us in knowledge and technical prowess. And even his humor was a little more, you know, you don't realize he just cracked a joke until a few moments later. <laughs> So he did an awful lot of observing, a quiet site, but he also was one of the instrumental people, no pun intended, with the building of the 16-inch telescope that we have now at Fred Lossing Observatory. And for those of you who are interested in uh, remembering him, then the memorial service is actually going to be on Sunday, this Sunday, August 8th, at the Britannia Yacht Club. And it's... He, when he left Ottawa, he went to the University of Western Ontario where he got his degree in physics, bachelor degree in physics, and from there he disappeared to California. And in California, his career spiraled up in very, a number of companies doing some rather clever and uh, pivotal work in some of those companies developing technologies. And you might imagine he's, he started here. In fact, there was an article written where he, he actually built the LED pointers. We had, it's very difficult to point the 16-inch the telescope in those days because the you couldn't get your eye on the truss. So he just put in some LEDs. LEDs were new in those days. You know, you had to put resistors in and they're weak and so faint. And he's one of the people that put that up out of frustration. Who are the other two on the photo? Yep, the, the other two, um, this fellow here is, you might consider to be the chief engineer for the 16-inch telescope. Gordy Grummet, and uh, the original sketches came from this fellow, Tom Tothill, and another fellow in the group, many of you might remember, is Fred Lossing, and Gordy took these, uh, uh, these Dreamland sketches and turned them into engineering drawings, and then he did the machining and the assembly and the work to make the telescope uh, reality. So in other words, 
Tom Tothill, uh, Tom Tothill and Fred Lossing, they came up with a design and it was up to Gordy to make it happen. And of course, he did a good job in making it happen. And, Tom, and, and uh, John was one of the people in the sidelines doing a lot of uh, working on the grinding machine and so on, uh, actually grinding the mirror, putting in the time for that. So he's quite a prominent member in the past in the Ottawa Centre and the fact that he uh, deserted us for California uh, is no reason for us to forget him. Thank you very much. Perhaps we'll see you there on Sunday. All right. Thank you very much, Rob. Uh, just a little uh, short announcement here just before we uh, get going toward the break. Uh, the Galileo scope that was uh, produced in association with the International Year of Astronomy last year uh, is now available through the Ottawa Centre. There are a number that have been brought down this evening. Al Scott, uh, are you taking the... Okay, so Al's, Al's doing that. Uh, and just before we go to the next one, oh, you may have been hearing uh, a, a wee voice on the side, all right? So uh, we've got uh, Gordon and uh, Concepcion Webster and little Julia. Hi, Julia. She's over by the wall there, right? That's who we've been, that's who we've been listening to. All right, so welcome to your first, uh, I think it's your first meeting, eh? All right, so sign her, sign her up, sign her up. Even folks, um, I'm going to t t talk about the wonderful star p star parties that we've been he he having at CARP. Uh, they're taking place at the CARP Public Library, which shares the site with the Diefen Bunker. So if you know about our Cold War monument to uh, Dief the Chief. Um, so you can see the observing site there is the parking lot. It's great, we got uh, lots of flat surface, a couple levels. Um, we sit up on the uh, furthest south part of the parking lot there, facing towards the open fields, and uh, folks park on the rest of the site. It's quite easy to find, it's e easy to get to. We got room for lots of scopes, and it's, uh, it's really, really great. The, the, People at the library and at the Diefen Bunker have agreed to turn out the lights for us, so it's uh, so it's actually quite a dark site and it's quite accessible. So it kind of walks a very nice line um, for what we often what we often encounter with sidewalk or public outreach astronomy is that if you've got a dark site, it's somewhere that people can't get to, or if you've got lots of people, it's in a very bright site. So this is this spot here is actually a very nice compromise. Here we have a couple of our members. We have a large picture of a small scope and a small picture of a large scope. <laughs> oh, there we go. Here we have closer to life size. Um, as a matter of fact, even that is not life size. The scope on the right uh, telescope is, uh, is quite monstrous and it's a wonderful piece of equipment. Uh, the one that Jeff has there is also a very nice very nice piece of kit, but it's uh, obviously considerably smaller. Uh, but this gives an example of the range of telescopes that we get there. This is on the south side of the, f of the lot, facing south, so you can see we look out, out over the field with some cows there. Next, please. Um, here's one of the uh, uh, more lavish kits uh, that one of the guys brings. This is Bart. You can see Bart on the right there, tempting the mosquitoes with his bare legs. Um, and uh, he, he, he has a trailer where, where, it, where he carries the telescope in. And once he takes the telescope out, he's got room inside the trailer. There's, some, there's a couple chairs and a desk and a table. And uh, he has a small generator computer system with several monitors. It's, it's a wonderful kit. Uh, the, the, that, that he brings. I think Bart has as much fun with the equipment a, a, as he does with observing, and that's okay. Um, and here's some more f folks. These are folks we hadn't even met, and, and, and I think this is really interesting that the word of the star parties is getting out, and it's not just people coming who want to look through a telescope. A lot of times it's amateur astronomers who haven't been involved with an astronomy group at all. They hear about this and they go, 
well, why don't I take my scope out there? Maybe I'll learn something. And, and so, um, or maybe I'll just have fun. So these folks here were folks that we hadn't met. They're not uh, part of the RAF, the RASC or, or OAFs. Um, and they just came out to observe, and, including one fellow there in a powered chair, brought his scope and set up and joined the group. And it was great. It was just a really good time. It was a great night. Next, please. Move on. Oh, well, look, just go back one there. Uh, here we have someone from behind. This is, I, I just wanted folks to have proof that Chris does do other things than sit at the computer here. <laughs> um, here's some of the contributors, participants in the day. There was a lot more. We, we couldn't find all the names, uh, but there's a few of us there. And next, please. And that's it. Uh, so th there's another one of those planned for tomorrow night at the same lo lo location. Um, the forecast has been looking fabulous all week up until this afternoon. <laughs> and with the perversity that only astronomers' weather can achieve, we have a little bit of cloud moving in Saturday night from 7 p.m. until midnight. Exactly the times when we would want to be there. Uh, it's a very small cloud system, though, and there's a chance it could move one side or the other. So we're going to call the go or no go at noon tomorrow. Um, if you're a member on the OAFS mailing list, uh, that's probably the first place it will be announced. Um, unfortunately, we don't have the web ad address, but if you just look up in, go in Yahoo groups for OAFS, O-A-F-S, uh, you'll find us, and uh, you can just join right then, and uh, you'll be on the mailing list. Okay. <laughs> Thanks a lot, folks. Thank you. Next slide, Chris. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Rob. Uh, and here is the uh, 2010 Ottawa Center um, uh, Public uh, Star Party uh, uh, schedule. Um, now, for those of you who aren't familiar with this and maybe are, are new to uh, these meetings here, um, at, at our star parties, which are, again are in, are in CARP at the, uh, at, the uh, Ottawa, um, at the CARP branch of the Ottawa Public Library, and sp specifically the parking lot, um, amateur astronomers from our club and from other clubs, as Rob mentioned, uh, come and set up their telescopes uh, and uh, share their, their, uh, their views of the uh, night sky and their passion for the night sky with, uh, with uh, anyone who wants to come and enjoy it. Uh, they are free events. They're open to all. We don't sell or promote anything, maybe our, maybe our passion for the night skies. But um, you can see that um, we've, we've had a couple already. There, or, we're always, uh, it, the weather really call, calls the shots. We've got an event scheduled for tomorrow. I haven't, uh, I'm going to wait till probably midday tomorrow before I make the go, no go call. As, as Rob said, the, uh, right up to the, like today, things were looking just so wonderful. And we'll see. Uh, so hopefully the, uh, the weather will change again, the forecast will change again, and it'll be clear uh, right through tomorrow, tomorrow evening. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll post a go-no-go no go on the um, uh, OttawaRASC.ca website, and I'll also send out emails to, uh, to various groups that, um, uh, that, that, uh, that uh, various um, email groups as well. Um, just one thing I wanted to let you know is that uh, I was talking to Gary Boyle earlier, and we actually do promote these events. Um, there's a lot of radio promotion. Gary sends promotions to, um, I wanted to share with you the various media outlets that we sent them to. Uh, Y101, Magic 100, KISS FM, Bob FM, Hot 89.9, uh, CBC Radio, and CFRA, as, as, as well as um, uh, television, CTV, and CBC. There, we, we send uh, announcements uh, to letting people know about these, uh, these events and to, of course, uh, check the website if this, for the go no go in the event that uh, clouds roll in and we, do, and we don't proceed with these events. Um, you don't need to have a telescope to attend these events. If you want to bring binoculars, uh, that, that works well. If you just want to bring your, you know, come, come without, uh, that's, that works also, also as well. So, oh, thank you. That's live. There's the nasty cloud. That's live? That's live. And there's our observing time. Don't you, <laughs> don't, you, don't you love it, eh? I mean, it's just the entire, for like the last three days, it was like, I thought this is going to be the easiest call to make, you know? And then here we go. And look at the size of the little cloud coming over us. <laughs> the opposite of a sucker hole. So it's, it's, uh, it's never easy. But um, the last thing I wanted to say just to before I close is that uh, if for, 
<coughs> these, uh, these stargazing events are wonderful for those people who want to sort of like try before they buy a telescope. So if you're not really sure what to, to, uh, to get and uh, you want to see what's all out there, well, the full spectrum of, uh, of, of equipment is, is usually at these, uh, at these events. So it's a wonderful opportunity to peek through each one of them and ask questions and you know, see what works for you. Okay, so I hope to see you there. Thanks. Okay. Up and onward. All right, so here we go with the, uh, uh, my presentation on uh, sunrise at Sinus Iridum. All right, we'll go to the first one, please. Uh, it was out on uh, June 21st. It was, uh, what, what happens on June 21st? Summer solstice, of course. So I was out in, uh, just before, uh, before sunset, and I had noticed this beautiful moon uh, up in the sky, so I jumped into the observatory in my backyard to, uh, to take a look. And... Uh, and then I thought, wow, this is uh, looking very interesting. And what I was uh, noticing was just over here, uh, this is called Sinus Iridum. It's the Bay of Rainbows. And uh, you have, uh, here's a close-up of it here. And uh, this, it's an old uh, flooded crater, right? So all we see is the one wall back here to the north. And uh, they're known as the uh, Jura Mountains, so uh, Montes uh, Jura. And what I noticed was that uh, it was just starting to be illuminated. So there's just the slightest bit being illuminated. So I grabbed my little uh, pocket uh, digital camera and I started firing shots for two hours, uh, you know, every 10, 15 minutes or whatever it was through the eyepiece of the telescope. So uh, I'll show you what I've done. And I've had technical assistance from Tim and uh, he's got a presentation, a tandem presentation that will go on the back end of this. Uh, it's called The Making of Sunrise at Sinus Iridum. All right, so uh, here we've got this nice shot of the moon. All right, do we need... These lights up here, can we get these down maybe, Tim, please? <clears throat> All right, so that's what I was observing, and it was still, uh, it was still daylight. The, I don't think the sun had, uh, oh yeah, no, the sun hadn't even set yet. It was uh, 8.42 p.m. So this is the area, we'll go to the next one, please. That's the area that we're looking at here. And if we go to the next shot, this is my slide from a month earlier, the previous lunation. Uh, when I spoke about uh, this area. So just to give you a couple of locator points, we'll see uh, in some, some of the images the crater Plato and uh, the crater uh, Bianchini just up on the, on the rim of the Jura Mountains, which run along here. You'll see the two craters, uh, Helicon and Leverrier. And all of this is part of Mare Imbrium, the huge impact basin on the northwest uh, uh, quadrant of the moon. Uh, right in here now, uh, the sinus iridum, it's about 260 kilometers in diameter, and the things to watch will be uh, Promontorium Laplace and Heraclides. Okay, let's go to the next one. So, uh, <laughs> I think I've explained before about my stunning photography. All right, so here we have an example. You should have seen uh, what I gave Tim. He'll show you what I gave him to work from this. So I've got a series of six slides, and I'm gonna walk down through them uh, one at a time here. And you're gonna see, uh, we're just looking at the region here. Let's go to the next one, please. All right. Okay, and we can see this, the sunrise uh, or the uh, sun, uh, the day sun, or nighttime terminator. All right, let's go to the next one. So now we can see it starting to be illuminated a bit more. And this was all happening across uh, virtually two hours. We're up to uh, 10, uh, 1049 p.m., so it's about two hours there. And I think that's the last of the series there. We go to black. Okay, I'm going to walk you back up through it just to peel it away. We'll peel it away one at a time. So obviously my exposure settings were uh, all over the map there. Okay, let's just, uh, I guess it's just as easy to walk back down. And now what's happened is uh, Tim has taken these images You've seen the pictures? Now sit back and enjoy the movie.
So I can't I can't tell you how how exciting that was to be able to go out and uh, and actually do uh, do the observation of this. The photography, in a sense, was secondary. I wanted to capture the event, but uh, anyway. So we'll, uh, we'll get Tim up, and uh, he'll tell you how he produced all of this for us. All right, Tim. Sure. The making of, yes. Um, and interestingly enough, that, that little uh, musical piece you had there is actually Vangelis, and it's called Dawn. So there you go. There's, there's, your, uh, there's your linkage. So um, sunrise over this area is a really cool chunk of moon. Um, so let's take a look at what we, had, uh, what we had going here. Brian approached me to see if I could uh, piece together some of his stuff. Here's what we started with. Uh, now, he's taken a handheld camera and simply shot down the barrel of the eyepiece. It's uh, technical, co technically called a focal coupling, and uh, it's a legitimate method of astrophotography. It, it, it works surprisingly well. So this is the six pictures that we've uh, culled out of it to, uh, to cover the full range of his two-hour uh, exposure run. Once you crop them and lay them out, it's not quite as uh, daunting as it looks, and the first thing that you're going to notice is, is there's a fair variation in tone and, uh, and overall exposure value from picture to picture. That one's fairly obvious. Uh, the next thing you'll notice is a bit of rotation from picture to picture, and there's some slight scale variations. Now, all of those things are bog simple to solve. Unfortunately, it's a little messier than that. You can see up here in the first picture that um, Plato has a nice, reasonably, you know, you can squint and make it circular. Uh, over here, it's starting to have kind of a blocky, rectangular look. But by the time you get down here, it's, it's got some really trapezoidal aspects to it. So there's quite a bit of change in the way the, uh, the, the pictures are showing uh, scale and uh, uh, morphological, morphological state, if uh, you want to use a nice snazzy $3 word. Distortion. Not distortion. Anyway, right. Speaking of distortion, uh, every lens is going to have some distortion, either in design or because of the angle between the lens and the target. And you'll always see that, uh, that second effect if you're taking pictures of tall buildings, you'll always see that. Photoshop provides a set of standard lens correction tools, which will allow you to undo the effects of uh, barrel and pincushion distortion and uh, perspective in two axes. So that's what I've done here with one of these images. And uh, you can see we've made sinus rhythm look a little more circular. Um, put in a modest on distortion of uh, barrel distortion and corrected for perspective. And that, that looks like it might do it, but unfortunately it isn't enough. So let's take a look and see the, the, uh, the problems you've got. The ideal world, you're going to be aiming your camera smack right up the eyepiece and your uh, optical axes are going to be absolutely coincident. Uh, yeah, right, that's going to happen. Um, so breaking it down, we can have transverse misalignment, where our optical axes are parallel to each other, but misaligned. And the, the obvious thing you're going to get there is vignetting, but it's a little worse than that, because it, you're going to have the maximum distortion in any lens at the edge. There's, there's no other way to do it. So this means that our nice, interesting part can be nicely and, and too heavily distorted. Or you can have angular misalignment, where basically um, the center points are aligned, but we're tilted, and that's even nastier. We've got uh, our hypothetical light rays going through multiple thicknesses of glass and multiple distances to the focal plane of the camera, so basically we've got a really nice nonlinear uh, distortion all over the film plane. And when we tie those two together, that's our general purpose case. The center points aren't aligned and you're rotated. Now, you can get, right, get uh, a lot of consistency if you use a, teles a digiscoping adapter where we basically clamp the camera in place. And at least that way, your distortion is consistent from frame to frame. But in this case, where it was handheld, our distortions are continuously changing. Tell me about it. <laughs> Tell me about it. Uh, now, uh, the later versions of Photoshop have provided a fairly nice uh, warp transformation tool where you basically apply a set of splines over the picture, and you can warp these uh, with the handles. And this, by the way, is not a particularly extreme uh, distortion necessary to, to do the correction. This is fairly typical of what I've run into. Now, we've got to be able to align the pictures to each other, and this is where uh, selecting features are going to come in. We're trying to take a picture of the sunset, the sunrise here, 
So what this means is we've got to be very careful that we're not aligning to varying, into changing light features, that we're actually aligning to geological features or selenological, if you prefer. So I'm, I haven't used all of these in every picture, but um, I've used these in, in, you know, throughout the process. The big ones, the big workhorses, are these two little eyeballs down here, Helicon and Leverrier, and uh, Promontorium Laplace. And interestingly enough, this tiny little crater, uh, Promontorium Laplace A, this by the way is a kind of a pathological crater name. Um, this is one of the 14 features on the moon that takes, uh, that provides crater names that is not in itself a crater. Um, these ones here in the night region, these are really useful for trying to peck, pin down the distinction between uh, geological features emerging and changing light patterns. And finally, Plato uh, and Lekonomy up here, these are quite useful for just pinning down the overall scale and, and positioning of the pictures. Uh, there's another little function here for Monty's Recti where uh, I'm using that to try and uh, get some regular, uh, get, get some consistency in the imaging in uh, light and, and tone from frame to frame. So here we've got a frame, two frames uh, laid over each other in Photoshop. The top one's been made partially transparent. And you can see here we've got a fair bit of misregistration. And it's not too bad. You'd think we could just move it around. But take a look here. The distance between our two versions of uh, Promontorium Laplace A and the distance between our two versions of Helicon and Leverrier are different. Mm. So uh, what this is telling us is we've got some nonlinear distortions across the picture. So we're definitely going to have to do some warping to fix this. Now that leads to a problem where you've got inconsistent uh, uh, warping from picture to picture.